Hey, we want to welcome everyone this morning. I hope that you have had an awesome week. We've had a busy week here at Pathway Church. Uh, this last week, we had vacation Bible school. We had day camp, and our high school students went to move in Lincoln, Nebraska, which was great. If you know someone that is a children's or student volunteer that's sitting beside you, I want you to help me make sure they stay awake during the message, all right? So please help me in that. But honestly, I say that because I would love for you to reach out to them and just say thanks. You know, be willing to uh, be thankful for the work that they've done. So grateful for so many great volunteers that we have here leading our next generation. It's awesome. Well, here's what I want you to do. Open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you have a smartphone or a Bible, if you turn there, we're going to dig in. And if you've read ahead or, or you knew that we are going to uh, work through chapter 11 here, you know it's about communion. And I do want to let you know we did not forget about communion, but we're going to celebrate communion together at the end of our service. And I'm looking forward to that special time. Well, as we go through chapter 11 in this first letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, it's actually divided in two parts. The first part deals with really what is proper in worship, and the second part, as I mentioned, deals with communion. The first part deals with the traditions of the church, and the second part deals with directives or instructions that Paul has given the church. And here we find the church once again in Corinth learning to live together, learning to really honor the bond of unity that Christ has given them. But there's a couple things here that I want to point out as we dig in. I want to say that these first 16 verses are a little challenging to be able to preach about. Actually probably leans more to a great discussion, which I hope you'll have in your home teams this week. But I want to let you know this as well, that as we look at these first 16 verses together, there's a lot of history, a lot of tradition that goes along with them. Now, uh, one of the things that we find often in history and tradition is our, our appearance, the, the way that we dress, the way we wear our hair, the clothes that we have. And here Paul is addressing this as well in the church. And there's a couple things that I want to make sure that we catch. I believe some things that rise to the service, surface that I don't want us to miss. And really what Paul is talking about here is male and female and how we come together and worship. And really, part of the impetus here that Paul's dealing with is there's been a little bit of a friction in the church. You know, Paul has been encouraging in tradition, and it's been traditional in the church for women to cover their heads, to wear a headdress, if you will. I thought I'd bring some of those today, so maybe some of you ladies want to wear them. No? Okay, all right, just asking. For the guys that are saying, you know, don't wear this, Make sure that you keep your head uncovered. And there's part of it when you read it, you're like, what are you talking about? And you kind of dig in and go, yeah, this doesn't sound very interesting to me. Sounds like Paul's giving, once again, a little uh, lesson here on what to wear or how to present yourself. And that is true. But there's something behind it. And I want to let you know that Paul is truly elevating both male and female. And showing the importance of our role, our gender, and how when we come together to worship, it really brings the reflection of God. So here's what I want you to catch. Don't miss this. God made us male and female, and it's important that when we worship, we are fully present and we are fully who God created us to be. I, I, I don't know if you thought about that. Probably not walking in today, you thought, well, I'm going to make sure I bring myself all of me, you know, as a male or female. And I thought maybe this might be an opportunity in the message to talk about guys wearing skinny jeans and how much, you know, I'm teasing. I won't go there. I'll save that one. But, but truthfully, what Paul is saying is, man, you are unique. I mean, when you come in as a male, I want you to recognize that as you come in this relationship, that God is leading you as a follower of Jesus Christ, He's created you with much expectation. He wants you to be a spiritual leader in your home. He wants you to lead in the church. He wants you to begin to show your creator what he has stored inside you. And when you worship and bring that into the church, there is a great part of that. 
And I want to say this as well. When God created female, I think he did some of his finest work. I'm just saying, all right? I mean, I think God did some great work in creating uh, you ladies. I, I can remember when Sarah and I were dating, and, and I was still learning about how a female mind works, you know? Anybody struggle with this still? Some males are nodding. Yes, I'm still. Sarah would have to go through things, you know, two and three times. She would have uh, dialed in on something, and, and I'd have to say, you know, honey, share me again. How do, how do you see that? I mean, what is it about that? God was preparing me because he followed three daughters there for me to really make sure I understood, and let me say appreciated and valued uh, these ladies that God has placed in my life. And I believe there is power in the male gender, and there is power in the female gender. And sometimes Paul gets a bad rap. Sometimes as we read through some of his writings, it seems like he will poke at the females uh, and their leadership and their gifting. But I want to say here, I believe he's elevating. He's trying to show them this, that really when God is calling you, he's calling all of you. Once again, he wants you to be fully present. You know, in our culture today, it seems like this is becoming an issue. I don't know if you watched the news this week, but you may have, and you may have caught that in Canada, there was actually a couple who had a child that decided that they wanted to leave the hospital without declaring their child's gender. So they're from the Gender Free ID Coalition. Now, that's a mouthful. Gender Free ID Coalition, and the vision of this group is to make sure that no one has to declare a gender on any public record. Now, I want to tell you, for me, it's weird. You know, I heard about it, and I thought, man, it's disappointing. I mean, it's almost like we're devaluing birth and the gender that God creates, you know, as we look at that, it didn't take me long in the hospital. And when my son came along, that was a quick one. I was like, whoa, right on, you know. I was excited. You know, love my girls, but to have a little man was pretty cool. But I want to tell you this. I, I feel like today it's like we're not showing the true value and the significance and the role that we play. And not only in life, but in the church. And and I just want to say, you know, we have to be aware that this is something I think the enemy is trying to steal from us. To not be willing to declare ourselves how God created us. To feel like that's insignificant or unimportant or, or not valued. Man, it's almost to me like it's the ultimate way of saying, you can't tell me what to do. <laughs> There's no way I will declare. I'm just going to stay here. And I want to tell you, in the church, I believe that when we come together, male and female, we form a great reflection of who God is. And these giftings and these personalities and the uniqueness that we bring, this chemistry that we have together is vital, I believe, to the worship of the church. Another thing that Paul wants to teach us is this, that God didn't create us to be independent of each other, but rather interdependent. Look at verse 11 and 12 here. He says, Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. So here's the deal. God is evening the table here. You know, we know that as we go back and look at Genesis, that man was created first, and then woman was created from man. But Paul is reminding the church and reminding men that they come from woman. Everything comes from God. And there's another passage in Ephesians chapter 5 where actually we use a lot about marriage, and it does have some of that emphasis. But he's really talking, Paul, about the church there as well. And one of the things he says is he launches into this passage that many of us know about honor and love, respect and love and obedience for one another. He teaches that we are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so there's this opportunity for us, once again, to value who we are and how we come together in worship. You know, Paul is assuming, you can look back here at verse 5, he's assuming for the women 
that they are coming to church and they are praying and prophesying. That they are declaring the truth. And they are as important a part of prayer in the life of the church as the men are. And this is something that we have to celebrate. We have to be willing to say, this is proper in worship. It is proper for us to come together. You know, there's places in the world where uh, still there's great divides in this. There's places in the church that there's still great divides in this. I think God is once again, through this writing, trying to teach us, man, there are good things that come from both of these roles that when we put them together, they really form a great reflection of God. Verse 17, Paul changes his tone and he changes his mood. And I want to read these verses together because now he's going to start talking about the Lord's Supper. And in this, he wants to issue a warning to the church. He's given them some directives and they don't appear to be following them well. Verse 17, it says, In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. I mean, I want to let you know, um, Paul is issuing the smackdown. I mean, this is something that you see him turn his mood. You see him turn his language. And, And honestly, Paul is a little bit hot here. And I wonder what it would have been like, I thought about this this week, what it would be like for Gene Carlson, who served our church for 40 years, our lead pastor, had great influence in our life. What if Gene got up on the platform and said, you know what, I want to tell you something. I had a great vision for this church. I had a dream for what we could do together, but I want to let you know I've been observing you and I've been hearing about you. And I say this now, that when you come together, you're actually doing more harm than good. So maybe we should stop doing this. I mean, I want you to get the gravity of what Paul is saying here. I mean, there is a division in the church. And it's not a division between whether you should eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols or not. The division is actually a gulf in the church. It's between the rich and the poor. And Paul is once again upset about it. I want you to know that once again we see the brokenness of the church of Corinth. And I think as we study it together, we have to keep asking ourselves, you know, is there brokenness in our relationships? Is there brokenness in the way that we are coming together? I want to give you a little bit of backdrop too so we make sure we understand what Paul is saying here. The Corinthian church was made up of household churches. We go clear back to the start of the letter. He identifies one of those households as Chloe's household. But these households, when they would come together, would celebrate a meal in their church service. I don't know about you, but I'd be all in on that again. You know? They didn't have the potluck after the service. They had it before the service started. And so they would get together and they would eat together together. And really the culmination of their time and fellowship and eating together came to the Lord's Supper. It was the highlight of the meal. That was the intent. But that's not what was going on. You see, what was going on is uh, the well-to-do members of the church who had the homes that many of these churches were eating in, well, they were getting together before others arrived. And they began to spread out their food, that they begin to bring the finer things. And what happened is over time is because they had the leisure to leave work early, the poor class, the common people who still had to work were showing up late and there was this gulf. Have you ever felt out of place before? Have you ever felt like, wow, I don't know if I fit in here. 
I remember some years ago, my wife uh, asked if I'd be willing to go to this evening at Botanica, uh, and it was a great evening, but it was supposed to be really nice, and, and she said, well, we're going to have a picnic, and I thought, great, you know, and I, I remember that day, like most days, I was going 100 miles per hour. We got to the end of the day, and I said, well, we're having a picnic, so I'll stop by Subway, I'll grab some subs, we can put them in our picnic basket, and we'll go. So it's good from my point of view. We show up at Botanica, and people are spreading out these nice quilts. Well, I had a quilt, so I felt good about that. And then they begin to unpack their picnic basket. Well, when they unpacked their picnic basket, they had china, and they had silverware, and they had wine and cheese and all this great food. And I'm like, I got an Italian, you know, from Subway. (laughs) I I just did not feel like I fit in. You know, honestly... I was a little embarrassed, more so for my wife. But I tell you, it's, it's a time that I felt like, you know, man, I, this is not the group of people that I'm supposed to run with. I, I wonder about the people in the church in Corinth, how those that didn't have the means felt coming to their church service and showing up late and being pushed into the courtyards away from the centerpiece. And Paul is upset about this. It's not a little issue. It's not an oversight. Paul is saying this. Man, I want you to know the church is beginning to look like the world, and the world looks like the church. And we come to celebrate the Lord's Supper, the centerpiece, the coronation of who we are, and there are people that actually can't make it to the table, because you aren't allowing them, it's a tragedy. And look back at how he says it here in verse 20 and 21. He says, it is not the Lord's supper you eat, for when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. Paul wants them to know this. You might think you're celebrating the Lord's supper. You're not celebrating the Lord's supper at all. You might as well just be getting together in your home and eating supper together. God is not honored by what you're doing. I mean, I think when we uh, consider this, we, we have to ask ourselves, have we been exclusive in any way? I think this is part of the work that we have to do as believers, to make sure that we're not being exclusive in our churches, in our homes, in the communities which we spend time in, to make sure that we haven't turned people away because it is not the message of Jesus Christ. And Paul warns them about this. Man, he's really going to shoot straight with them here in verse 27. Look back to the text. He says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. How would you like to hear that? I just want to let you guys know what you're doing. It's unworthy. It's unworthy of what Christ set it up to be. And when you do it, I want you to know that you are actually sinning against Jesus. You think you're commemorating his life? That you're somehow bringing some type of memorial to him? You're not bringing a memorial to him. You're sinning against the very thing that he did for you. He gave his life on the cross. And Paul goes on and he says, you know, here's the deal. We look at verse 28, and we continue to look in the text here. He says, I want to let you know that part of the process of preparing yourself for the Lord's Supper is that you're to examine yourself. And you're not examining yourself because if you took time to examine yourself, you would recognize that you've been exclusive. You recognize that you're hurting others. And because you've been unwilling to do this, Paul goes on and says, there is a consequence. I want you to know that sin brings consequences in life. And the consequence for the Corinthian church is that some of them are sick. Paul says here that some of them have fallen asleep, which is a reference to death. God is trying to get the attention of the Corinthian church. You know, here's um, something that I think is really disappointing but makes sense. The enemy, Satan, of course, when we have something that is so significant to our faith, of course he is going to come in and create sin and chaos. He's doing it here in the church of Corinth, 
And he's done it today around the Lord's Supper. He's done it actually throughout the history of the church around the Lord's Supper. God has created and instituted something that is so valuable, so significant to our faith, and we're so divided over it. There, there's so many controversies that have been stirred up because of it. I mean, there's lots of questions that church has been trying to answer. You know, when you take the Lord's Supper, is it okay to take it in an individual cup? Or do you share the cup? Well, what's proper? What's right? Should you eat it as a wafer or a cracker? Should it be an unleavened bread? Well, what, what should it be? And you have the church divided on that. Should it be juice or wine? Is it okay to have wine in the church? Or should you stick just to juice? You know, that we're divided on that. We're divided over who should serve it. I mean, who's the right people to serve this? Can women serve it? Should just the men serve it? And what needs to be said alongside it? Are, are there special words that we need to give to bring value to it? And who actually can say those words? Are there just certain individuals that can highlight this or say this and prepare the communion table? Are there others? You know, we, we have divided over this. We've created even dominations around communion. I think if you study scripture and you think about the how-tos, I want you to know there is very little, very little in Scripture about the how-tos, and yet we've allowed it to rise to such an important level. It's like we're missing the point. There's also been other divisions. Um, probably one of the most notable division is over why do we take communion or what does it represent really? It's, it's our doctrine what we believe about it. You know, and there's been a divide between the Protestant church and the Catholic church. You know, the Catholic church believes that when you take the Lord's Supper, that when you eat the bread and when you drink the juice, it is actually the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And they believe this and, and they hold this as their tradition, what they believe about communion. That is not what we believe. That's not what our church believes. We believe that Jesus has created this meal as a representation of what he did on the cross, an opportunity for us to understand the symbolism. Paul writes about it here as he records from the Gospels actually what happened that night of the Last Supper. In verse 24, it says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And Jesus said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So we believe that actually this bread that we take, it is representation of Christ's body. It symbolizes his body. We believe that when we drink the juice, it's actually the representation it, of Jesus' blood that was shed on the cross, it symbolizes the power of his blood to wash away our sins and cleanse us and allow us to live new. I mean, I think it's hard for us to get to a place where we actually believe that it is literally the body and blood of Christ because there at the Last Supper, his body was intact. And he was teaching these followers the importance of the meal. You know, really it was the Passover meal that he was celebrating and so when he held the cup, I want you to know that he would have been addressing not just the past covenant of Passover, but now the new covenant. I mean, when those followers hear the words of Jesus, new covenant, I think they recorded it in their mind. I think they're still trying to figure out, what are you talking about? But I think when he went to the cross and when he shed his blood, and they recognized what the blood represented over the door frames of their house. And now they recognize what the blood represented over the door frame of their heart and their life. They understood the power of the new covenant. But I want to say this. You know, one of the things I would say about the Catholic Church is they do a great job building their service to allow the Lord's Supper to be the crescendo of it. And that's something I think that we can learn from our friends. And I think, once again, we've created lots of areas where we've created divides. And really, the Lord's Supper is meant to bring unity. For us to hold on to what we believe, to make sure that we're studying the right thing, 
so that really we would observe what Jesus was asking us to. This is his point. Do this in remembrance of me. And so here we are, Pathway Church, thousands of years later, coming to the table, celebrating the Lord's Supper. Is there unity? Do we truly do it in remembrance of what Christ has done? The Lord's Supper should be open to all. I mean, policemen and politicians, airline mechanics and accountants, teachers and baristas, grandparents and teenagers, the rich and poor, it should bring us together to once again reflect and remember to allow our lives to be recalibrated. You know, that's what Paul is talking about here in verse 28 when he talks about self-examination. He wants to make sure that when we come to the Lord's Supper that we're not coming flippantly like the Corinthian church was doing. That, that really it would be the crescendo of our life that, that when we come to examination, we begin thinking about what that meal means to us. Now, I remember as a kid kind of having part of the self-examination principle down. I remember actually my first communion. I don't know if you do yours, but I remember it coming down the row and being able to take it after I accepted Christ and I'd been baptized. And I remember being very excited about it. And I remember I was supposed to confess my sin, and so I did that. And I'd say over time, I began to kind of get stuck there, just confessing my sin. That, that was a part of the self-examination. Now, I don't know how it was for you, but I remember sometimes the communion tray was coming down the row, and I'm like, I'm still working on my list, you know? I still got a lot of sin to confess here. You better back that thing up a couple rows, you know? And I remember being stuck there. Like really the focus of it for me was just on my life and all the ways I'd fallen short. I wondered, does anyone have as hard a time following Jesus as I do? Does anyone struggle like I do? I remember sometimes when the tray was coming as well, just feeling so guilty, so overwhelmed with the sin in my life. And there's a good part of that. To recognize that what Jesus did was, man, it was so radiant, it was so brilliant. It's like a diamond on black velvet. And when I look at his life and I look at mine, once again, the power of what he did on the cross, it's brilliant. But I also think that there's so much more to self-examination than just confession. I think really, you know, if we go back and we reflect on the mill, when Jesus was taken with his disciples, one of the things that he was trying to remind them was that even though they would be separate after his death on the cross, that they would be separated from doing life together, that one day they would take this meal again together. Now, I don't know how much of that you think about when you're taking communion. I mean, do you think about the heavenly banquet when Jesus said at the table, I will not drink from the vine again until the day I drink with you in paradise. And I want to tell you, the greatest toast we're ever going to experience in life is going to be at the eternal banquet of God himself, Jesus revealing his church I mean, the power of that, the excitement of that, I hope that when we take communion, we start thinking about that, that our hope pushes us on. Through any trial or any tribulation, any suffering that we have in life, we would say, Lord, we know that you have promised us, you have given us a hope that there is something that's yet to come. One day we'll experience something so much greater than this life. You know, communion, the Lord's Supper, I believe, is a powerful opportunity every week. It's an important reminder for us, a memorial of what Jesus has done. And to examine ourselves, to make sure our, our mind and our thoughts are working in the right way, I want to give you a tool. It's actually one that I learned from a guy named Michael Green. I think it's really valuable. I'm trying to put it in play in my life in a new way, it is a solid tool to use for self-examination. 
The team's going to put it up here, and I want us just to look at it together. I want to encourage you, if you have a piece of paper or you have a phone, to take a picture of this. I think this is good. We'll try to get it out on social media to you today. But I believe these are six great steps for self-examination. The first one we talked about together. When you take the Lord's Supper, are you looking backward? Are you looking backward to the cross? I mean, are you honoring what Jesus has done at the cross? Are you just allowing the communion tray to come down and just going through the motions? Are you looking inward? Are you doing inventory to make sure there's not a sin in your life that's holding you up and limiting you from God doing his good work in your life? That there's somehow some foothold that the enemy has, that you want to pray that Christ would give you, once again, the strength to overcome. He's already given the power at the cross, but giving you now the strength to be able to overcome that sin. Looking up to me is the idea of looking up to examine your relationship with God, the rhythm of your life in Christ. Are you spending time in the Word? Are you spending time in prayer? Are you practicing spiritual disciplines of meditation, maybe solitude, thinking about that? The next is to look around. You know, this is something, once again, that's highlighted in Paul's letter to the church. The Corinthians weren't looking around or else they would have recognized the people in the courtyard, those that had been excluded from the mill. I want you to think about this. Is there anyone in your life, in the church, maybe in your family, that you have a relationship that is broken that needs to be fixed? This is part of the process of looking around and making sure those relationships, which Christ died for, would be ones that would be meaningful and ones that we'd be willing to do whatever we can to live at peace with one another. The next one, as I've talked about, is to look forward. Are you looking forward to that heavenly kingdom? One day where there won't be any pain, there won't be any suffering, and we'll be able to experience what God truly created us to experience, life in him. Are you looking outward? You know, do you think when you take the Lord's Supper about those who don't know him, those that need to experience the good news of Jesus Christ, I mean, the Lord's Supper, I believe, each week should spur us on to want to share our faith, to want to make sure that, man, if there are people out in my neighborhood or in my workplace, on the ball teams that my kids play on, that I would be willing to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. You know, as we come to this time, I want to ask everyone if you just bow your head and close your eyes. And we're just going to do some work together. I want to give a little bit of space before we take the Lord's Supper together. And the first thing that I want to do is I just want to give you an opportunity to reflect on where you're at. In this season of life, how are you viewing the Lord's Supper? Are you taking it in an unworthy manner? Unintentionally. It's just something that you've kind of got in routine in, and, and yes, you understand the power of it, but it's really not displaying powerfully in your life. I mean, if that is you today, I just want to offer you, like we've been doing throughout this series, an opportunity to repent of that and just say, Lord, I just want to ask for your forgiveness. I believe I've been taking this in this season in an unworthy manner, and I want to, I want to get refocused. I want to be able to really understand and celebrate the power of what you've given me. If that's you, if you need to repent because you feel like you've been taking this in an unworthy manner, I just want you to raise your hand. Just as a sign of your repentance, with everybody's head still bowed, eyes still closed, this is between you and God. God's good. Thank you for being open, allowing your hearts to be moved. And one of the things that uh, I want to make sure that we do before we leave this weekend is to allow anyone who has not experienced the power of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection to live out in their life to accept Jesus and what he has to offer you so that you can be free from sin, you can be free from death, and you can walk with Christ for eternity. And if that is you, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, don't let today go by. 
I want to challenge you just to pray this prayer just in the quietness and the stillness of your heart. Just follow along with me. Father, thank you. I thank you for the truth that I've heard today. And I thank you, Jesus, that you died for my sins. And I have plenty of them. But I just want to ask you to come into my life and to make me new. I want to follow you. As much as I understand it today, I want to follow you. You know, with everybody's head still bowed and their eyes still closed, if you prayed that simple prayer, a prayer of confession, that you can't do it on your own, that you weren't meant to do it on your own, that you want Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I just want you to raise your hand. Just raise it high as a declaration of that. Just say, that's me. I want to be a part of the family of God. Keep your hand up. It should be the most proud moment of your whole life to recognize that God has the power to save through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, Father, I, I pray. I pray in closing, closing here, Lord, that you would do your great work in us as we take this meal together. I pray, Lord, that we would honor this memory that it would live out in us, not just as something that is a tradition, but something that is truth. And Father, that we would celebrate it. Lord, thank you for those that made the decision to accept you for the very first time in their lives. We welcome them as a part of our family. It's in your name we pray together, Jesus. Amen.